migrant and refugee communities. If you are interested in becoming a multilingual natural helper, please contact Lori at apichaya.org. I hope we can add this to the chat. We, um, API Chaya proudly supports language accessibility, and we thank them for their support for love in the time of COVID. Um, we also give thanks to the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods for support with interpretation, and to the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Um, we're going to start today's program with youth interviews, and I want to thank Alex for having that media ready. We have a media-rich program, and we're doing it on Zoom, and anything is possible, so thank you to our audience for your support. Um, the art club young people who do those interviews are part of a program at Brettler Family Place in Sandpoint and special thanks to David Oliveira and Oliver for their support in doing that workshop. I am going to hand you over to our, our amazing event MC. I'm going to show my face really quickly. Nikita Oliver. Um, Nikita, thank you for taking it away. Thank you so much, Davida. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Nikita Oliver, and I use they, them pronouns. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to do my very best to speak slowly, to support our interpreters and our CART interpreter, to make sure that this event is accessible. And I want to encourage others who speak to also be mindful of that. I, uh, Tonight's program is designed very intentionally to be bilingual and to connect the themes of mass incarceration and detention for Black Indigenous communities of color, uh, including Black, Native, Asian, Latinx, Pacific Islander, and all of our melanated siblings around the world. To make this event as accessible as possible, we are utilizing captioning in real time, also known as CART interpretation. So shout out to Cleo Brooks and Lisa Hutchinson. We also have live interpretation from English to Spanish and from Spanish to English. So big thank you to Stefania, Fanny, Sandra, and Orlando. And I just want to encourage us English speakers who are not used to this experience to really pay attention and note the value of having this experience of hearing uh, the beautiful language of Spanish and then needing to access interpretation. Um, and just note uh, what that means, especially for those of us ha who have grown up in a place where our mother tongue has maybe been centered. Let's tune in to some of our Spanish content and hear some mantras recorded by the Restencia family. Uh, please hit the chat with one word about what love in the time of COVID means to you. And while you're doing that, let's talk about access to interpretation. There should be a globe. If you look to the bottom on your Zoom screens, it's in the bottom right corner. It looks like a world or a globe. And if you click that, the language options will show you and you will have an audio in Spanish and an audio in English. When you click the icon with the square and the CC button or closed caption button, the English caption sh should appear. So again, look at the bottom of your screen. To the far right is a globe that says interpretation and it provides language options. You can also mute the original audio. That way you can, if you need to isolate the language that you want to access, you're able to do that. And if you want to access closed captions, there is a button that says CC that you can also click. All and right. I just want to take a, okay. Go, go ahead, Davida. I was gonna say, whenever oh, you're ready, I can play the love in the time of COVID mantras. Go ahead. Okay. Amor en tiempos de COVID es paciencia. Amor en tiempos de COVID es unión. Amor en tiempos de COVID es fuerza y jamás seremos vencidos. Amor en tiempos de COVID es esperanza. Amor en Amor tiempos de COVID es igualdad. Amor en tiempos de COVID es unión. Amor en tiempos Thank you so much, Davida. 
Um, and I also just want to let you all know uh, if you need to access support, LRT is our tech support with API Chaya. You can message them and they will provide you with uh, directions on how to access uh, interpretation. And then again, if you're looking for the closed caption button, if you go to the bottom, there is a tab that says, or a button that says CC, and that should help to access the closed captions. I hope um, you all will enjoy this next video with young folks from the Art Club in Sandpoint. Uh, you'll be hearing from Azeb, Lizeth, and Nevea, whose brilliance and critical thinking we deeply appreciate. Uh, we love your energy. And we're going to also see for one of our loved ones, Dakota Camacho, on deck, uh, who will show us about getting moving to music. And I want to give you a heads up, grab a marker and a blank piece of paper, because uh, Dakota does a live set where we will have opportunities to do some drawing. Uh, the, the video we're going to watch uh, with these young people is going to direct us to our four themes for tonight. Those themes are healing and repair, eyes on native and black mass incarceration, free them all, art hit with Sayer, resistencia historias, uh, resistias, resistencia historias, family stories of detention, and care not cages, a mother on the front lines of COVID outbreaks. So please prepare yourself to hear some stories and also watch a very hilarious video. I invite you all to stand up and I'm gonna play a song. I'm gonna invite you to just do what you see me doing. Our goal on Thursday is to help community members understand what an abolitionist is. So am I correct, Nevea, Lizette, and Azeb, that the word abolition is new to you? Yeah. Wait, abolition? I can't say it. How do you say the word again? Abolitionist. 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 OK. So the nice thing is you get to use all of your curiosity to have a conversation with the abolitionists on the call. Brettler Art Club, you ready? Yes. yes. What is an abolitionist? What is an abolitionist? Well, I understand an abolitionist to be someone who wants to abolish uh, the police in the criminal punishment system. What is abolish? Well, abolish means to take it apart and get rid of it. So I wanna take apart the police, take apart jails, and take apart prosecution, take apart other systems that maybe hurt our communities. Uh, get rid of them, and then build something better that actually takes care of us. I don't understand why you guys want to be an abolitionist. I have no idea what that means. I see myself being part of a bigger movement of people. So we're not, sometimes it feels like a club, right? Like we all share this value of wanting to end policing, end detention centers, um, close down jails, but really just kind of this bigger movement of this bigger dream of a better world. I have a real quick question. Are you guys both like saying um, that you guys should have like a better place for people that get arrested? So at least for me, I think that there are alternatives to sending someone to jail and actually like working with people so um, that they don't continue those cycles of harm in the future. Abolitionist. Abolitionist. Um, what kind of abolitionist are you? I, I help people build relationship skills, help us be able to relate to each other in a good way and, um, and address conflict, and also help people who are being harmed find a way to get safety and support. And usually that means getting away from the person that's causing them harm. I learned about this because when I was growing up, my mom used to beat me and my sisters up and we didn't tell anybody because the cops and the school system would take me and my sisters away from her and from my dad. And we didn't think that that was a good idea. And so my older sister reached out to a bunch of community members that were outside of our family and built a safe home for us. Did your mom hit you guys for no such reasons or did you guys do something bad? Well, I don't think that anybody deserves to get hit. 
And yeah, I think that my mom was actually hurting too, because she used to get hit for no reason. And she didn't know another way to help us stop doing things that um, she didn't like. And, and she did, didn't have the support that she needed to make a different decision. Yeah. Lisette is trying really hard to say my hand is raised. Oh, that's what you're doing, Lisette. Thank you. And this is why we co-facilitate so we don't miss cues. What's your question, Lisette? Why are you an abolitionist? I am an abolitionist because I believe that you and, and I and our communities, our friends and our families already have what we need to take care of each other. I would rather have a future where we all treat each other like family or like community. I'm an abolitionist because prisons and jails have a long history of being based on hurting people, discriminating against people, picking out people that are black and brown and send them away, way out in different places across the state. You get forgotten about, never see them again sometimes. That's not how we treat people. It's a, it's a broke system to start with. And so you can't ever fix something that has a bad foundation and it hurts people that look like you and me. Are there different abolition? I can't say it, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Abolitionists, are there different ones? I think so. Like you've heard today, like abolition means different things to different people. But I think that like at its core, it's coming from a, like the same place. It's about making the world a better place, not just prisons. And I think abolition is about creating a different kind of system where we're not punishing people when they've done something wrong. And that means not having prisons at all. Uh, about the to not have prisons, how about like someone literally just killed someone? So that's why we need prisons, in my opinion, because everybody needs a punishment for something they have done wrong. Part of Part of our hope is that we get to a place where we're able to help stop harm. If we put people in jail, it doesn't mean we'll stop murders. It's about creating a world where people are well cared for and we have strong, healthy relationships. We can do the work of preventing things like murder or hurt to each other. May I be your, not just your facilitator, but your art teacher for a moment? Because this is for love in the time of COVID and I want you to put your hand on your heart. Say, this okay. is my heart. This is my heart. I love my heart. I love my heart. Five minute free draw. What's making a world so safe and beautiful that it never needs a prison? Or you're drawing one of the beautiful abolitionists that you met. Mm. Nice. Yeah, that's what that. I love in the video. I, that, I like that. Big people, can we give our interviewers a round of applause for their curiosity? Hey! hey. Hard work for inter oh. Azev, Nevea, Lizette, thank you so much for being incredible interviewers. Get real close to the screen. Far away. Close to the screen. All right, that was an amazing video. Hello, everybody. My name is John Page. How you doing, Matt? Good, good, good. Good to be here. It, that video had a lot of energy. It had me moving over here. I, I thought it was live, and I ain't yeah. cut a rug in a minute. So it's good to be here. It's good to see everybody. Thank y'all for joining us. And Matt and I, I'm going to let y'all share in on the conversation. Matt, what did you... uh? What you think about the video? Would anything resonate with you? And and you know, were you thinking of responses to uh, how you would re respond to what's an abolitionist? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, abolition, yeah. But uh, the thing that stuck out to me most, <laughs> and I wasn't surprised, was that as amazing as those those young people were, and with all their brilliance in that moment, mm -hmm. that the young people, the way that they thought to respond to harm was was with, was with punishment, and uh, unfortunately, you know that's what we've all been socialized to believe. That's what we've all been socialized to do to meet harm with punishment. Mm -hmm. But punishment is just another word for harm, and it doesn't involve accountability. It doesn't address circumstances or conditions that make harm possible. It doesn't center those who have been harmed. And it only perpetuates harm. What do you mean, center those who've been harmed? What, what does that mean? So, in centering the people who have been harmed with the current criminal legal legal system, 
um, their role in justice is is non-existent other than just being labeled a victim and being used against the person who caused harm. Um, they aren't asked what what are they needed or what do they need or how they've been impacted or what could help them in their healing. Okay, um, okay, okay. So. Okay, right on, Matt. Matt, um, I, th I think I was remiss. So, y'all, I, um, I work with DeVita. I work for the city. I work for the Office of Civil Rights and I work with DeVita and other folk uh, on this call trying to make uh, our communities better. So just to give you an idea of who's talking. And Matt, if you want to introduce yourself and then we'll get into some other stuff. Okay, um, my name is Matthew Murphy. I am a HEAL fellow with Collective Justice. What's HEAL? Uh, huh? What is HEAL? Um, so HEAL is Healing Education for Accountability and Liberation. It's a restorative justice process that um, I had the opportunity to participate in. And, uh, Matt, you said a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I need to uh... go okay. ahead, John? Okay. So, Matt, what 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 brings you to this? What what brings you here tonight? What what, what brings you to uh, to the work that you do? You, you mentioned restorative justice. Yeah. 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 What brings you to this work? Well, what brings me to to this work is is it's my truth. It's it's my lived experience. Um, like so many others, when I grew up, I grew up experiencing harm. Um, I grew up witnessing people being harmed, mm -hmm. people in pain without access to resources, mm -hmm. dealing with depression and intergenerational trauma. Um, mm -hmm. We were all living in a constant state of crisis, not, not knowing how to cope. And I drank, I smoked, I took from others what I didn't have, and I hurt people. Okay. And uh, when I went to prison, I continued the cycle of harm. Even though as I grew older, it began to make less and less sense. It was my learned behavior. It was my, uh, that was, that was my uh, survival strategy. It's crazy because there were all these things that I knew so intimately that I, I, I couldn't make sense of, but I knew them so intimately and the things that I was doing didn't make sense either. But 12 years into my 16 year sentence, um, I had a chance to participate with uh, collective justice in that that uh, restorative justice and transformative justice uh, practice. And uh, well, it was a restorative justice practice and I was introduced to transformative justice. But uh, I was given language and names, names of things that, those things that I knew so intimately and uh, as well as skills to care for myself um, while I began to process my experience. And uh, the language and names for the things I knew so intimately, um, it really helped me in processing. But uh, there we built community. And uh, I would just say the reason, the reason why I'm in the work and what brings me to the work is that my, my experience is not unique and that I'm not the only one suffering. And I mean, everyone that I knew, they were suffering from the same thing. So that's why I'm in the work. Okay, Matt, you, you, again, you said a whole lot, but for the I sake know. of time and the other things. Uh, yeah. good to, so what's restorative justice? And you mentioned transformative justice. What are those? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. So restorative justice and transformative justice, they're, they are a way to respond to violence and harm that doesn't create more violence and harm. And they work to cultivate the things that can prevent harm. And my understanding is that while restorative justice can be done within systems of oppression, mm -hmm. like the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. transformative justice is pol politically aligned with abolition and the doing away of the prison industrial complex. Um, I do so. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, yeah. man. You're on a roll. You you you're a good practitioner. You wear it well. So, man, let me ask you a question though. How does restorative justice, transformative justice? How do pick one of them? How do they keep me safe? How do they keep people safe? Okay, so with uh, with restorative justice, um, restorative justice and and transformative justice, what they do is they center they center community and they center relationships. Okay. And they center the needs of people. And the things that keep people safe are community, their relationships, mm -hmm. and 
there, it's having what you need. So, I mean, because if you don't have what you need, it's hard to have healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in a desperate state, state of crisis, it's, it's hard to be present with others and have their interests, their well-being in mind mm -hmm. when you're fighting to survive yourself. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, building healthy relationships, I would say, that, that's, that's a key role. And, uh, and, and recognizing other people's dignity as well as yourself, your agency, autonomy, and uh, I mean, valuing those things. Accountability is a big part of it too. Right, can you talk about that? What you mean when you say accountability? Because I think people, people uh, connect accountability to uh, punishment, right? So what, what do you mean when you say accountability? Okay, so what's true for me is that when it comes to accountability, that a person can't be forced to be accountable. Accountability requires agency. Well, people will say, people will say if, if, you know, people yeah. say all the time, well, I want this person held accountable. Yeah, yeah, so. So that's I mean, whether they want to or not. So if, if you harm me and my reaction is to hold you responsible by harming you back with punishment, um, you have no active role in that and you're, you're not accepting any responsibility. Okay. You're just being harmed in, for the sake of it. And that it, there's no accountability there. Accountability is a continuous practice. Okay. It involves defining your values, striving to act in alignment with those values. Okay. And when you fall short of it, considering the impacts of your actions, apologizing for that, and making a plan for the future where you can honor your values and honor the well being of other people and their agency and being punished and thrown in prison it doesn't do that um in prison all i felt was shame around around what i did i didn't feel any sense of accountability um yeah it's matt you just you just met it got you to smile you just heard my alarm go off so we got about a minute a little more than a uh, minute so is, is there anything that would be helpful for us in terms of thinking about some of the stuff you've talked about? Um, I would say that when something happens or a harm happens, mm -hmm. that it's important to ask what is going on and why is this happening? Mm -hmm. And consider the conditions surrounding the harm. How is this possible? Um, and then ask the person who has been impacted or harmed, what is it that they need? I mean, and you know, if they, if, if they want accountability, help them find that, you know? Um, or if they want answers, if they want understanding, if they want restitution. Um, but it's important to center the person who's been harmed, not just uh, brush them aside and throw someone away in their name you know ask what they need okay matt and we hope to see more of this work man we really appreciate it. i really appreciate you talking to me man i'm building a beautiful relationship and got you to smile a couple of times we really appreciate it thank yeah, you, you so much. thanks everybody yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you so much matt murphy and john page for talking to us uh sharing with us about the importance of healing and repair uh, to our live stream audience, please show some love for Matt and John in the chat or using some of the reaction features. It's beautiful to have our loved ones from inside offering insight into our work across communities to address mass incarceration so we can build safety for everyone. And that is what we value. Uh, welcome to folks who are joining us for the program now. I want to provide a friendly reminder to our speakers to remember to speak slowly for our captioning and for our interpretation. Please click on the little globe icon to access Spanish audio and click the CC icon, which stands for closed captioning, to activate the, the captioning features. Tech support is also being provided, so feel free to chat LRT from API Chaya on the Zoom chat if you need further assistance. 
Thank you for your patience. Uh, and thank you so much to our squad that is making sure that this event is accessible for everyone. Um, an art hit with Sayuri is about to happen and we cannot wait. Before we do that, I do wanna give a shout out to Mama Nikki who made that incredible video, uh, listening to the young people interview us about abolitionist, I think that's how you say it. Um, that was a really fun time and they did an incredible job on that video. Uh, so now we will have a Free Them All art hit. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sayuri Rafai, you say them, she, her pronouns. And I'm calling in from the occupied lands of the Puyallup people or Tacoma, Washington. So I'm gonna share a little bit about this mural that I painted back in 2018. That's on the corner of Market and 11th in Tacoma called Reemerging and Healing. And then talk a little bit about La Resistencia's Free Them All campaign and a recent art project. Um, so with abolition, you know, we need our creative juices flowing. Um, so for me, this piece here um, is something that I was able to work on through SpaceWorks Tacoma. And every time that I approach a public art project, I really want to think about what is the story that needs to be told. So in 2018, when I had this opportunity, um, I was really been deep in with um, La Resistencia and with a lot of work around the liquid natural gas plant on the Tacoma Tide Flats, both of which I feel so much are um, linked. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, before I show some close-ups of the mural, I'm going to read what the text says for everyone. We can no longer afford to be possessive. We can no longer profit off of caging and deporting our neighbors and call this a welcoming city. We can no longer rape and pollute earth for her resources and expect her to survive for our children's children. We must listen to those impacted by environmental injustices, trust them, protect them, love them. So I won't have time to go into everything in detail for all of you, um, but my hope is to share a little piece. So for me, my first introduction to the detention center was in 2011. I personally had a family member that was picked up in Oregon and brought to Tacoma to be detained in the detention center. Um, as a student in college, um, I learned that there was a hunger strike at the detention center. Um, and that was the very first hunger strike of any detention center anywhere. And pretty soon after that, there was a um, big solidarity day. And that was my first rally um, at the detention center. I heard folks like Maru speak and began to learn about this place that um, similar to Matt was saying that I, my family member has had a lot of shame about and I had no idea kind of their experience. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about this historic moment of the very first blockade at the detention center um, with and for undocumented peoples, um, including Maru Moravial Pando, um, featured here on the right. Um, and I was actually finishing this portrait um, the very night before Maru's first immigration hearing. Um, the Department of Licensing had colluded with ICE and given away her information. Um, and so I wanted to make sure Maru knew, you know, whatever happened the next day, we would keep fighting. Um, on the next panel over um, it features Puyallup tribal member Dakota Case. So the liquid natural gas plant, if you're not familiar, is something that P uh, Puget Sound Energy has worked on um, to construct this 8 million ton tank to hold liquid natural gas on the Tacoma Tide Flats, not too far from the detention center. Um, I remember one summer evening in 2017 um, that we were all down there trying to stop um, the construction of pipes being put into the ground which PSC was saying was um, for sewer, which we knew was not the case, right? It was for this LNG plant. Um, and Dakota at that time, you know, was pretty quiet, was saying, hey, the police are being hostile. You know, we've held this space for three hours. Um, we'll come back tomorrow. 
Um, and as we were leaving, my friends and I noticed a van um, full of SWAT um, police and SWAT gear, right? So they were ready to come, not to protect the people who were there protecting the land, protecting the rights of the Puyallup tribe um, and their treaty rights, but to protect the corporations. And we found the very next day um, that Puget Sound Energy was um, paying five police to be there um, for $62,000 a day to protect the corporation and not the people. Um, on the last slide, I want to honor Mariah, who's also been a young leader within the LNG movement. Um, Mariah is Standing Rock Sioux and Puyallup, and in the middle of the mural is the, um, the medicine wheel from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. Um, right before uh, folks in Tacoma and from the tribe had learned that the LNG was being unlawfully constructed, um, you know, Standing Rock was um, facing a lot of pressure um, with the pipelines being built in. And so folks here were saying, this is our standing rock um, and we need to stand our ground here. Um, so all in this to say the detention center, you know, is a for-profit immigrant detention facility on the Tacoma Tide Flat. It's also a super fun site, right? So we get reports from people inside saying we, the, vi the water is not viable for us to drink. You know, the air, depending on the the time of year, whatever chemicals are being spewed into the atmosphere on the industrial zone it also impacts them, right? So these environmental injustices that we continue to see happen in black and brown communities, you know, all of these things are interconnected in the ways particularly corporations and our police state continue to uphold that, to extract resources, to, um, you know, possess human bodies for their profit. I wanna to move to a more recent project. Um, over this quarantine time, right, with COVID, um, we we're getting testimonies from people in detention, unless that is Estancia in particular, um, hearing testimonies from people inside, you know, who are already stressed for all of the multiple reasons they could be being detained, right, on top of the fear of catching COVID inside of the detention center. So a woman from the Congo by the name of Naomi wanted to have her case come forward. Um, because of Naomi, this whole campaign for Free Them All happened over the last few months. And increasingly more people being detained wanted to share their story. So with the collaboration of a lot of local artists um, who drew their portraits um, in tandem with sharing their testimonies, even video testimony. This was the very first time that La Resistencia was sharing faces and names of people because of how dire the situation is inside of the detention center. So with um, the Henry Art Gallery at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, very recently, there's been silk screens made of a lot of the portraits that myself and a lot of other local artists um, have made for this Free the Mall campaign that is now visible to see on the streets. Um, so my hope is that one day um, the detention center um, will be closed and we can dance um, on the ashes of the detention center in front of this wall um, with people who have been released, with people who have been organizing in the background and we can celebrate and eat food and have beautiful music together. And that's my dream. Let's give a big round of applause for Sari and sharing with us uh, the importance of advocacy, art, systems change, um, and how those inter intersect to really build the culture of abolition and giving us the vision of a world beyond. Um, you can find out more about, about Free Them All by checking them out on Instagram. Um, following and giving support. I know on November 30th, there will be an action, a caravan um, to show that detention centers like the Northwest Detention Center are uh, deeply interrelated with things like the Department of Corrections and we need to free them all. Next up, we have a deep dive with Resistencia on detention centers. We know that the separation of families is unfortunately a common theme in our country. Recently, undocumented communities were left out of the CARES Act. 
to help make connections between mass incarceration and the stories of detention you are about to hear, Dakota will share some facts about mass incarceration. By the way, stay up. Dakota is going to also close out at the end. But first, Dakota, you mind dropping some knowledge on us about mass incarceration, some facts about it in the US? Absolutely. Hoi, Hafa Adai. My name is Dakota. And yeah, I'm going to share these facts with you. Um, I think the first, you know, really important thing to know is that um, Native youth are incarcerated at three times uh, the rate as white youth, three times as likely to be incarcerated as, as white folks. Um, and another important element of the story is that the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Uh, the U.S. only has 5% of the population in the world, and we also have 25% um, of the worldwide prison population in our country, um, which is really terrifying. Also important for us to know in Washington is that the, the three strikes law has had a really negative impact um, on our communities. It, Washington was the first state in the nation to pass a three strikes law, and that was laws that made long mandatory sentences. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, of the close to 20% of incarcerated people in Washington, in Washington are serving life sentences. And of the Washington prisoners who are serving life without parole, 50% of those are the results of three strike sentencing. And so we really wanna see an end to that as a part of our abolition strategy. And the last important uh, fact that I'll share with you tonight is that the that black, black youth are, are are most affected by mass incarceration. Um, the criminal justice system affects black children more, um, affects some more than others. And that is black children are 10% of King County's kids and 50% of the children locked up in the juvenile detention center. So that means that black children are um, five, times, uh, five times more likely to be locked up. Um, those are some really horrible things um, to have to share with you all today. I look forward to being able to share some other facts um, on, a, on a day soon. Over to you, Nikita. Thank you, Dakota, for bringing that to our attention. And also, I got to love the video behind you, also done by Mama Nikki, uh, just reminding us Legendary Children is happening on November 21st. Um, and I want to also highlight that since 2017, the Seattle Public Library has been following communities lead in focusing on abolition as one important strategy for addressing the harms of over incarceration or mass incarceration here in the United States on Turtle Island. Thank you again, Dakota, for those facts um, and the sobering realizations that you shared with us. As promised, we had Historias de Resistencia. These are oral histories shared by local community members who have experienced detention firsthand. For this portion, we will have Spanish to English interpretation for non-Spanish speakers. Again, please click the globe icon to access the English audio that's in the bottom right hand of your Zoom screen. For CART interpretation, there is a slide deck with English on it for folks to follow along. I also want to provide a content warning uh, Stories of harm can be hurtful and triggering. Please take care of yourselves and one another. Breathe and be gentle. In between these stories, we'll be, we will be chatting with Resistencia organizer Maru Mora. In the chat, you will find info on different articles and organizing efforts. Estuve en la detención también en 2015. Tuve un poco de, de miedo porque no sabía nada cómo estaba el centro de detención. A mí me intentaron sacar dos veces sin, sin autorización de... Nomás me decían, hey, ve, ve y firma que va a ser tu salida para acá en Estados Unidos. Y yo pues iba y tenía una abogada de orientación que nomás era abogada de Norwest de inmigrantes. Eh, ella me andaba orientando más o menos me decía que, ok, me llevaron a, a, a firmar mi, los papeles y yo lo que iba a ir a ver era el consulado de Guatemala, 
yo decía, ¿por qué vengo a ver el consulado de Guatemala si, si, si voy a firmar mi salida? Entonces, yo me decía, ¿puedes firmar? Y aquí te van a, te van a, ¿cómo se llama? Y yo le decía, no, no voy a firmar porque, y lo bueno que el abogado me había dejado su tarjetita y, y yo se la di, pueden llamar a ella, no es mi abogada, pero ella es la que me anda orientando. Y pues la llamaron y me dijo ella que no firmara el papel y, y no lo firmé. Y gracias a Diosito lindo, en ese ratito cuando yo, le dije a ella, ella llegó ahí y me dijo, yo voy a agarrar tu caso, yo te voy a sacar de aquí. Tuve un año y un año encerrado, yo te voy a sacar de aquí, me dijo, no firmes. Y de ahí agarró mi caso y después otra vez me intentaron sacar otra vez. Ya me llevaban en el avión, como no firmé, me habían metido en el avión para mandarme para Arizona. Yo, eh, y yo le dije, ¿ves? y ya ella habló por mí y me dijo, no, no que no me llevaran, de ahí solo yo y otros dos compañeros más nos regresaron para, para la detención. Fue muy triste porque, pues, la verdad, tuve una pelea ahí adentro, yo creo que por eso me querían sacar, porque, pues, por, se perdieron unas cosas, eh, yo, se me perdieron unas cosas, como yo era el que repartía comida, se me perdieron, entonces, yo di la queja y, y entonces el otro empezó a buscarme problemas, yo creo que por eso me querían sacar. Tantas cosas que pasé ahí, la verdad, y al fin... Me dieron una fianza grande, no la pude pagar y la abogada fue la que me sacó así sin pagar esa fianza y la bendición de Dios. Pero sí, la verdad, la, es un trato ahí adentro que, como dice aquel, si, te, si no sabes nada y no te orientas, lo sacan a uno lo más rápido que pueda con tal de que tú no agarres información para, para que estés ahí. Pues eh, lo más que quieren ellos es muchas cosas que, que pasan ahí. No puedo decir esto, que... Let's pause for a moment and take in what each of these stories is bringing to us. To do this, we're honored to bring a beloved organizer, Maru Villabando. Uh, Maru, do you mind introducing yourself and adding context for community around the stories these families are sharing with us? Gracias, Nikita. Uh, mi nombre es Maru uh, Mora Villalpando y soy parte de la resistencia. Estas historias que escuchamos uh, son de personas que están no nada más haber sido victimizadas por el sistema, son personas que han decidido luchar contra el sistema, son personas que han resistido dentro del sistema. Uh, la historia de Marlon es lamentablemente común, en donde la migra tiene todo el poder de decisión de liberar a alguien Así como han tenido la, de, la decisión de detenernos, tienen todo el poder de decisión de dejarnos salir. Sin embargo, hacen lo opuesto y hasta a escondidas tratan de deportar a la gente. Así es como... Try to deport people, people even in a way that's in hiding. hiding. The bail that Marlon is talking the way about, that that's, speaks, even, that's just the way to kidnap They want to charge us to free... It's not oh, to liberate. Uh, he people. said bail is not low. The Today, bond is not we little. Today we heard about the story of a person that who has a bail of, of $10,000 and we thought dollars. Usualmente son más. Cuando habla él de que hay una problemas con otras personas en detención, es algo común también. El sistema allá adentro se crea para romper el espíritu de la gente, para crear divisiones, para que no se organicen, para que no luchen y no resistan. Y sin embargo, él tuvo la fortuna de tener un abogado. Muy pocos tienen esa oportunidad. Y aún con abogados, no significa que vamos a ganar. Nosotros siempre le decimos a la gente detenida, si tener abogados funcionara, nos, nos dedicaríamos a conseguir abogados. Pero la ley no está de nuestro lado. El sistema no está de nuestro lado, así que tenemos que luchar. Eh, es claro que la historia de Marlon es también un reflejo de, de los gobiernos que colaboran con la migra para deportar a nuestra gente. Escuchamos una y otra vez cómo los consulados se meten a convencer a la gente a que se dé por vencida y se deje deportar. Entonces, este no es solamente un problema de Estados Unidos, es una colaboración de gobierno a gobierno para deportar a nuestra gente, para separar a nuestras familias, para crear este terror entre nuestras comunidades. Uh, pero también es un ejemplo de, de lucha, porque Marlon está aquí, Marlon está luchando y es, y es siendo parte de una resistencia, es como vamos a nosotros a ganar. Thank you so much, Maru. 
Uh, let's dive in again and listen to the last two stories. Amado will share her closing thoughts right after. Que mi hija y yo eh, quedamos solas. Fue muy sorpresivo. Estas cosas vienen de la nada. Cuando uno menos te lo imaginas y te separan de la familia, ¿no? Al principio uno tiene que saber qué es lo que tiene que hacer. Tienes biles por pagar, un apartamento por pagar. Uno trabaja pero no alcanza. ¿Y de dónde cree uno que van a sacar el dinero cuando dos personas trabajan para poder mantener todo? Entonces, esa, eso fue la encrucijada de que mi hija y yo pasamos, ¿no? En este caso, yo como madre soltera, se podría decir que tenía que empezar a hacer, a buscar todo. Y es, es este, bastante chocante al principio porque uno no sabe qué hacer. Y felizmente que si, si uno no tiene familia, eh, se la vería bien verde para poder este, sobrevivir. Pero aquellos que tienen familia, por ese lado quizás sí, ¿no? Pero de igual forma, eh, si bien tenemos mucha ayuda, es bastante difícil porque, por ejemplo, en el caso de mi hija y yo, de vivir en un departamento, un apartamento completo, tuvimos que pasar a un lugar muy chiquito, muy, muy chiquito, un Arby. Entonces, ella y yo hemos estado casi nueve meses, recién nos acabamos de mudar felizmente a una habitación más grande, pero son este, eh, ejemplos, ¿no? De que, de que lamentablemente los de AIS nunca van a poner su mano al corazón y decir, oh, estamos capturando a esta persona y, y, y pobrecita sus familias. No, ellos no piensan en, en las familias, en la gente que se paran, en los hijos que sufren o los padres que sufren. No les interesa, ¿no? Y, y este, es básicamente cómo uno tiene que arreglárselas para poder sobrevivir. En mi caso, solamente tengo un hijo o una hija. Pero, ¿qué pasa con aquellas madres o padres que tienen dos, tres, cuatro hijos? ¿Cómo hacen? Entonces, mi perspectiva es esta. ¿Cómo las personas de afuera, los que quedan eh, con la sorpresa de que su familiar lo agarraron, cómo quedamos nosotros? Muy Este, detenido por migración respecto a que yo tenía por haber manejado por cinco veces por manejar con licencia suspendida ese fue el motivo para que me llevara a migración detenido fue algo algo horrible va simplemente mirar el pueblo aquí donde vivo y pues con mis lágrimas en los ojos porque pues ya no iba a poder a ver a mis hijos ya no los iba a poder ver y al llegar allá empieza la discriminación desde aquí el de migración me dice tú eres de Guatemala vas para Guatemala le dije no yo no te equivocas yo soy mexicano Dice, no, tú eres de Guatemala. Le dije, no. Me dice, fírmale aquí, te vas más rápido. Le dije, no te voy a firmar nada. Me dice, ¿vas a pelear tu caso? Le dije, sí. Dice, pues vas a tardar mucho tiempo. Le dije, no te preocupes por el tiempo, el tiempo es lo que tengo. Eso lo hice, ¿por qué? Porque nunca quise demostrarles miedo. Pero por dentro estaba yo que me destrozaba al saber que podía yo ser deportado. Pero a la vez dije, no, yo no puedo perder la fe. Tengo a mis hijos aquí, quizás ellos me ayuden. Batallé mucho durante un año y cuatro meses. Lo horrible de hoy, que estar ahí no nada más es este, el encierro, las luces, la discriminación por los, por los guardias, la, el no poder, este, a veces cuando no tienes alguien que te ayude, que es poca la familia que tienes aquí, no hay, a veces no, no hay forma de cómo puedas tú, este, de que te puedan poner dinero, ¿verdad? Yo batallé mucho en eso. Entonces, a veces tú buscas la forma por al ver a los demás compañeros cuando están ellos comiendo, que tienen una sopita de perdida y que tú no tienes ni para eso. Es feo, se siente horrible, ¿no? Yo mis hijos no podían hacerlo porque ellos están pequeños. Yo no vivo con su mamá y pues la verdad no nos llevamos bien. Entonces no había yo forma de que, que pudiera yo tener dinero. Todo lo había perdido, lo que había yo contado, la persona que me iba a ayudar o que le dejé yo mi, mi propiedad y mi dinero, se lo gastó y me quedé sin nada. Entonces, lo que yo siempre he tenido es de que nunca me gusta quedarme parado, quedarme, si yo ahora qué voy a hacer, no, yo lo que hice fue aprender de los demás compañeros que llegan de las, de las prisiones a hacer manualidades, yo aprendí a hacer origami, de esa forma fue que yo pude 
comprarme. Ya después pude yo tener una bolsa de café, eh, unas sopas, un chocolate. Y ahora los compañeros me pedían préstamo. Me... Yo tengo 20 años. <risa> tengo 6 años de estar aquí. A mí y a otros niños nos llevaron a, a un, se puede decir, centro de detención. Algo así como llamados como las perreras, les dicen algo así donde tienen a todos los niños. Cuando nos llevaban para ahí, nos trataron como los peores criminales y solo éramos que niños, jóvenes. Y nos pusieron, me acuerdo que a mí me pusieron a la par de una muchacha que es del de Salvador y a las dos nos encadenaron de los pies juntas, o sea... Y yo me puse a pensar y yo así como que, y me acuerdo que yo pregunté, ¿para dónde vamos? Y ellos dijeron, ah, van de vuelta a su país porque aquí no, nos, no los queremos. Y luego dijo la otra muchacha, um, la del Salvador, ¿pero por qué nos hacen eso? Apenas somos unos niños. Y, y ella nos dijo, pues no queremos, no los queremos aquí. Me acuerdo que nos subimos al avión sin saber obviamente para dónde íbamos, con la idea que íbamos de regreso a nuestros países, ¿no? Porque eso fue lo que nos, había, nos habían dicho. Um, al llegar a las ferreras nos dieron champú de piojos porque nos dijeron que traíamos gérmenes, que traíamos piojos y cuántas enfermedades. Nos dieron unas toallas y ropa usada para que nos bañáramos. Y llegamos, nos dieron el champú de piojos y nos dijeron que Uh, traíamos enfermedades, traíamos piojos, teníamos que bañarnos con eso y directo al baño. Lo siento. Lo siento es que tengo mi bebé. Tengo un bebé. Entonces, oh, ok. Tienes dos minutos para llamar a tu mamá y si no te contesta, no te podemos dar otra llamada. Um, le dices lo, lo que le tienes que decir y le dices que estás bien. No sabía, eso se llama intimidación. Honestamente, yo no lo sabía. Eso se llama intimidación. Están intimidando a los niños. Uh, bueno, yo llamé a mi mamá, le dije que estaba bien, um, que me sentía un poco mal porque casi no había comido y la comida estaba mal. La señora me quedó viendo y se enojó mucho y me dijo que la llamada se había acabado y tuve que colgar. Cuando nos sacaron para ahí, uh, me mandaron para Nueva York a un centro de hogar y ahí estuve aproximadamente un mes. Uh, me mandaron con, no, se suponía que nos daban clases, pero prácticamente nos enseñaban como la historia de América. A los 16 años, mi única, prácticamente mi única ayuda era mi primo. Él me ayudaba en cosas de la escuela. Era mi fuente, se podía decir, fuente de ingresos, de alimento, etcétera. Y es muy injusto y es muy duro ver cómo se llevan a una persona que está saliendo. Yo me acuerdo que yo iba para la escuela y él iba para su trabajo. Y Ais lo estaba esperando afuera de la casa. Le quitaron todo. No lo dejaron decir ni una sola palabra. Lo trataron tan mal y lo agarraron como que si fuese un criminal. Y es muy difícil. A mí me acuerdo que yo le dije a mi mamá que podíamos hacer como una cajita para recaudar dinero y a tratar de sacarlo. Me acuerdo que iba todos los días con esa cajita a la escuela. Thank you so much for sharing those stories, Maru. Uh, I'll give you closing thoughts. Gracias, Nikita. Es um, muy Es muy doloroso escuchar estas historias a pesar de que las oímos todos los días. No, no deja de doler. Um, pensar que son historias que han pasado y siguen pasando. Esto no es nuevo. Esto no empezó con Trump. Esto tiene mucho, mucho tiempo. Um, las, las historias que acabamos de escuchar son un reflejo de por qué somos abolicionistas, de por qué tenemos que deshacer el, el sistema por completo. La, la historia de la persona que agarró la policía es, refleja claramente la colaboración entre policía y la migra, y por eso lo decimos, la policía y la migra, la misma porquería. Es, 
estoy agradecida que abrieron precisamente hablando de cómo este sistema va más allá de un, una, sola, una sola detención o una sola cárcel. Está todo integrado. La, la historia también refleja el tiempo de espera. Lo hacen a propósito. Entre más tiempo la gente esté detenida y más gente esté detenida, más dinero hacen estas corporaciones. Pero no nada más es un, un sistema privado de, de, de negocios. Es también un sistema gubernamental. Entonces, cuando luchemos en contra del centro de detención de Tacoma, no nada más vamos a luchar por cerrar un centro de detención privado. Vamos a luchar por cerrar el centro, por cerrar la jaula. Y todas las jaulas. No vamos a permitir que surja una jaula que sea manejada por el gobierno. Esta historia contaba también de cómo se dedican a hacer eh, arte dentro del centro de detención para pasar el tiempo. Es lo peor que, que la gente nos cuenta. Muchos que llegan de prisión al centro de detención dicen, prefiero la, la prisión que estar aquí, porque al menos en la prisión tienes una sentencia. Aquí no sabes cuánto vamos a durar. Es la constante incertidumbre. El, el tener no, you have a... You have a certain amount of time here. You don't know how long you're going to be here. You can't really have contact with your family because there's glass and phone. And now with COVID, you don't have social visits. People are starving. They're, they're doing strikes. They're saying it's not hard because the food is, is disgusting to incite people to work for a dollar a day to to purchase from the commissary, which is another business. What we're seeing in these stories is the impact. Why uh, do we allow to criminalize people for being adults and making any mistakes? Uh, they also started criminalizing children. It's not surprising that now the extension of prison extended to, immigra to immigration. Immigration is extending to uh, the detention of children. This system continues to expand if we allow it. So we have to fight to end it. We have to fight and it is urgent because today, at least um, according to ICE, one person has uh, COVID in the detention center. We don't believe it. We believe there are more people with COVID in the detention center. In the past two weeks, um, at least um, we know that there have been three people from prisons uh, outside of the detention center. They brought them knowing that they have COVID at the same time that in Governor Inslee said that um, that the gatherings of five people at home are not allowed. How can we allow that? that there are units of more than 30 people in the detention center. How can he talk about a protection order and he forgets about detained people? So we have to take care of ourselves except for the people who are in, in jail. Uh, are they not human? Do they not count? We are asking to uh, demand from the governor. His silence is only approving the torture that our families and our people are going through. So we ask you to go to our social media, follow the instructions there, communicate with the governor and and tell him, stop your silence, do something. And also in Tacoma and Pierce County, because they support the governor's order. So if they do support it, they cannot forget that whether they like it or not, the people detained in Tacoma are residents of Tacoma, whether they like it or not. We are also asking you to join our campaign. We have a campaign to close the detention center. You can sign uh, for our campaign, go to our webpage, and if if you're not an organization, it's okay. You can support us by calling the governor. You can tweet, you can tag him and also uh, tag the city of Tacoma in Pierce County. We cannot allow uh, for the situation to get worse and let them think that we just pretend. Enough of this terror, enough, enough treating our families this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maru. Um, I just want to take a moment to let uh, all of that breathe. Um, 
There is a lot of suffering that many of our loved ones are enduring. Hay mucho sufrimiento que eh, los um, some things that we can be doing around calling, emailing, tweeting at the governor and also the mayor of Tacoma and other folks um, in that area on Puyallup land who have the ability to respond immediately to the human rights crisis that is happening at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma. So I encourage everyone to do what you can um, and support uh, our loudest assistance family and um, really pay attention to all that is happening. Just because uh, we will have a new administration does not mean that everyone is safe. So let's be thinking about how we can stand in solidarity with all of our loved ones. So thank you again, Maru, for helping us understand and receive those stories. At this point, we're switching back to English with Spanish interpretation available. So the way that you can access this again is by going to the, the globe at the bottom right hand of your screen where you will see interpretation and you can select for Spanish interpretation. There's also the option if needed for closed captioning by clicking the icon that says CC. And I want to remind our speakers to please speak slowly so that our interpretation can keep up with what we're saying and make sure that our our evening together is accessible or, or as accessible as possible for everyone. And as I promised, we are bringing back Dakota uh, to help us do something more interactive. So take a moment, grab a sheet of paper or use your voice. Uh, we have been dropping a lot of knowledge during this program and growing with each other, but it's also important that we find ways to connect in real time, even though this is a virtual event. So if you have a loved one who is incarcerated or a message about love in the time of COVID, do this. First, let's say the names of our incarcerated loved ones all together. AV folks, can you please put us in gallery view so we can see each other's faces? And you might have to change the view on your screen uh, from speaker to gallery if you had it set for speaker. And on the count of three, I would like for us all to unmute. And so, and when we do to say the names of our loved ones so that we can know we are lifting them up together tonight and every day. One, two, three. Donald Moss. Anthony Wright, Ant Anthony Hamm, Benjamin Nathan, Billy Freiberg. James Sophia and Jerome. Hammond. Christopher Blackwell. Johanna. Mm. Everyone in the Northwest Detention Center. Mm. Shelton. Mm. Monroe. There's some folks saying unmute them, please, AV. Free them all. Yeah. <laughs> Leah, Terrence. Francisco Houston County Jail. You got vice. Camacho. Ian, Gabby, Rene, Ruben. Rene and Devin. Danielle Regis. All our babies in the youth jail. Before we move on, I want to acknowledge the names in the chat. And if you don't feel comfortable unmuting, but do you want to share the name of your loved one, please feel free to place them in the chat. And um, maybe on the count of three, we can all, wherever we are, say free them all. One, two, three. Free, free them, them all. all. Yes. Thank you so much. 
for sharing the names of your loved ones. If you have your markers and sheets of blank paper, go ahead and take them out because we wanna see your signs. Uh, what's one word for what love in the time of COVID means for you? And be ready to share once Dakota closes their set. Um, and after Dakota, we have our final story about a mother who lost her son during the COVID pandemic. She'll be interviewed by the lawyer who helped her find her son. And we will talk about care, not cages to close out. So Dakota, it's all you. We're so excited for you. Hoi, Hoffa and uh, family. Um, well, first of all, I just have all these tears. Um, so I want to uh, invite us to um, just acknowledge our tears, acknowledge our bodies, um, these beautiful bodies that we have. And maybe I would invite you all to touch yourselves, just to like, just to make sure that you know that you're here. And um, if your video is off and you want to take a risk tonight, I invite you to turn your video on just for this moment. Because, you know, if we were in person, we would get to like actually see each other and, and be with each other. And what's up, Larry? Um, and, um, and right now we have the beautiful opportunity to try something different and new in this digital space, right? And so with that, that, uh, that something new and different, I know after hearing all those facts and hearing all those stories, I've got a lot of emotions that are coming up and I'm feeling a little bit uh, scared. So I just wanna like invite you all to like shake, shake your bodies. Ah! And maybe even just have let out a little shout like, ah! oh my gosh, yeah, make faces in the screen like this, ah! oh my gosh, ah! Ah! there's a world, ah! 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 awesome. Oh, and then I want to invite you to, um, if standing feels accessible to you, to stand up and just acknowledge the floor that's supporting you and acknowledge the ceiling that's above you or the open sky. Yeah, and reach up, reach up to the sky. Ooh, and take a breath. And then fold down to the floor if you can, or just go and touch the floor if you can. Touch the floor. Take a breath and come back up. And this time we're gonna reach up to the ceiling and we're gonna say, thank you, sky. Uh, and come down to the floor and say, thank you, earth. Yeah. Come back up. And uh, in my culture, the past is in front of us. So I want to encourage you all to reach out to your ancestors right now. Reach, touch them. Yeah. And then if you can, just get really close to the screen, like we're reaching out to each other because we're all each other's ancestors. Oh, I can almost actually feel your breath on my hands. How awesome is that? And then you want to reach out to the past behind you. Ah, oh, and then maybe you, after you reach behind you to the past or to the future, see, I don't even know my directions, reach out to the future. And then you might want to just shake because you're like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. But then you want to jump up and down because the future is collective liberation. Yeah. And then you want to get really close to the screen. You want to show just like the best part of your face. You know, like for me, it's this like lip corner right here. Get really, really close. Really, yeah, a lot closer. Can you get even closer? Like, just like this one little corner. Yeah, what's your favorite part of your face? Larry's, it's uh, the, the, that, that one little dot under the eye. Ricky, the, oh, yeah, okay. <sighs> okay, how is that? Are, are we all alive here? Are we alive? Can you feel, can you feel each other yet? Yeah, awesome. Those are the gorgeous smiling faces that I love to see. Hey everyone, my name's Dakota. I've got some music to share with you all. Um, and I just want to give big gratitude and thanks to everybody that's been a part of this event so far. And um, I want to invite us to keep that same interactive, loving energy as I share this music. Um, and I want to give a big shout out uh, to the black communities of the South End and the Central District um, for teaching me about what it means to be an indigenous person, um, for teaching me what it means to be in connection to my ancestors um, through sharing this like beautiful technology of hip hop. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the things that my ancestors taught me and some of the beauty that, uh, that the black communities of uh, the Central District and the South End have taught me. Um, 
Yeah, here we go. Are y'all ready? Okay, you, you, you have to have that same energy that we just had. Don't quite sit down yet, I just sat down. Yeah, Larry's got it, Larry's got it. If anyone needs some energy, just pin Larry, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'll invite you to stand up or even groove in your chairs. Live in a good way. And see if you can make the dance move and pass it to somebody. Oh. Hey, who's doing this? Copy me. Just copy what somebody else is doing until they notice you, you know? The pathway that I'm taking is sacred because I walk it. Conscious of creating the world when I am talking. Stopping all the traumas in my mamas and my fathers. My flow immerses my whole lineage in holy waters. Soaking souls of those before with spoken words. I open doors to ocean shores and hope for more. Healing and revealing reconnection to my feelings. Seeing to the sky, embodying the ceiling. Revelations of creating bonds of our relations. I'm taking the path of facing the facts, facing the facts of our existence. Reconnection to the mystics. The language of the spirit is the OG scientific. Dancing the inscription of intuitions, hieroglyphics. Reading current movements is all Pacific physics. Listen to the birds as their direction pivots. Cause they sing a song of life and they taught me how to live it. So I live your best life as you're jamming out to this song. You can practice all these things that we had close to the screen, far away. Close to the screen, far away. Have a little fun. This is not a Zoom meeting at the end of your day. I'm driven to sell the sack, man. More than chase a stack, man. My path ends. Running up in cages like a path then Coming from the past into where the future happens. Time travel when I'm rapping, laughing, the past and the time. Crafting a rhyme, I happen to find a path of divine teachings. Ancestors reaching through dimensions. When I bring attention to genealogy's meaning. Seeing while I'm dreaming, receiving tarot card readings. Oh, when I'm focused on my breathing. Honey, lone trees as they loan me. I don't even know the words right now because I'm out of breath from all this movie. But we can celebrate. Give it a good day. At the end of the verse. Anyway, live your life a good way, everyone. Hey. That liberation is coming to us soon, y'all. Living a good way, living a good way, living a good way. Living a good way. Okay. Can you copy me? really taking us to the end here yeah oh i love y'all too in the schedule Yo, that, that was right. amazing that quote okay well this uh last thing i'll share with y'all is a uh, it's a prayer to free them all and it's a uh, Shout out to my lineage. Hello, I -N -S -Y. What was that? I don't know what I just heard, but this is uh, my creative and cultural lineages. It's a prayer that for all of us of the planet to remember that we belong to the earth, we belong to each other. And uh, Nikki, remind me not to ever do a live performance in a turtleneck again. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Tracy, you love that too much. <laughs> Shout out to the Central Ditches of the South End. Maybe I need to put my hair up next time. You know, maybe that'll make a difference. Woo. The lineage of the lines that I inscribe as I write poems transcends minds, concepts of timelines and time zones. I'm from the ancient earth crust, the birth of the primordial is my home. I've flown around with sky gods who walk the jungle with Mother Earth on a tightrope. Made the bang your root as I pray I can understand the truth. Did Brother Sita teach me how to heal as I withstand abuse? And Buddha teach me how to be lonely as a bandicoot. As my family move away from homeland, the USA broke. 
New saying a movement became a new trend in human history. Miserably called diaspora. Another concept that can capture what we've been through. So my pen moved to trace my line back home and I roamed through the infinite black zone. Classic rocking with my dad's homies. Praying as the star of Hawaii's navigating her jazz songs. Africa's children making melodic atlases. Indigenous craftsmanship and I practice this craft so I honor the masters of the free flow. Audition show within the Greek, oh, yeah, absolute. Hip hop is that old. I fast forward to sci fi on 20th and Jackson. Fool is the satisfaction food. Ladies first to hip hop, period. Is every Sunday night African hands are doing patterns on the drums that go. <laughs> Can every sing to LD a rope and I is getting his neck on. You speak true speaking, eclipse and gentrification. Community unity's got your back, huh? Back when Setsy Beast was that ceremony and that song, before the battle in Seattle was won by dot coms. No matter the tactics that we practice, they say we fought wrong. They murder and slay, occupy and drop bombs. We say, oh, my tail to the way with tail and go on like. <laughs> We are the people of the land, y'all. Every single one of us. Man motu hit no we fin net nan nan sag man see fin at nyo goo hit no see he da he man no ta hards in nahata no Show some so love fantastic. for Dakota. Show some love. Big love. Huh. Thank you so huh. much. Huh. Yes. Let out, let out our cries. Thank you so much, Dakota, for leading us in our liberation, our bodily autonomy, freeing our bodies and our voices. Free them all includes freeing us. So um, deep love. I also want to acknowledge that um, this week is Transgender Awareness Week and tomorrow is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And also remember um, our trans loved ones are that are incarcerated and knowing that um, that is one of the fastest growing populations within uh, the Department of Corrections nationally. And so, you know, as we're as we're talking about mass incarceration, understanding the intersection with genders is really important. Um, thank you, Dakota, for leading us in that moment of liberation. And at the end of tonight's last interview, there's going to be an announcement about uh, Dakota's incredible work, co-curating legendary children with the library. Um, it'll be an incredible celebration of body and movement and freedom and liberation 
Um, and yet again, another opportunity to engage with um, our beloved queer and trans community. So please show up and show love. Um, but for now, if you grabbed a sheet of paper earlier, we want you to get real close to the screen, like real close and show us your one word meditation on what love in the time of COVID really means. Shout out to Art Club and Sandpoint for showing us how to use our imaginations to dream up a world of safety, care, and compassion. So go ahead and get yourself in gallery view so you can see other people's words. Keep them up there so we can get some screenshots. I love it. Awesome. I see liberation. I see intentional revolution, revitalization, um, interdependent, regenerative imagination. I might miss a few y'all, so apologies. Thank you so much for participating. Dakota, you might have to say that word for me. Patience, Nevea, yes. Mesnon. Mesnon, thank you. Connection, community. Thank you so much for sharing your words with us. That's so beautiful and exactly what we were hoping for. So we're gonna prepare for our last segment. And if we could prepare the audio. Gotcha. And I just want to remind folks that if you need access to interpretation, uh, you can click down on the globe at the bottom right. Um, and if you need access to closed captioning, there is a button that says CC and that provides cart interpretation. Thank you so much. Hello, America. My name is Becky Brown, Mother Brown. My son is 24 years old. He was taken from Reynolds' work release in April, in the middle of April 2020, or actually the date was May the 1st. He had just gotten there two weeks prior from Shelton. He was released to Reynolds work release and he was on his way home. Two weeks into him being at Reynolds work release, I come to find out at a very, very, oh, the words, how I found out they took him. I lost contact with him and I knew something was wrong because he was excited to be home, coming home. And then he stopped calling us. The only way I found my son was through the help of the community. I called Re Reynolds Work Release after two weeks of calling and writing letters. No response from my son. I knew something was wrong. He's right around the corner. And he's not contacting me? No, something's wrong. The worst fear for a mother. Where's my child at? You know in your heart. So the community helped me locate him. And it was so terrifying. Now, they shipped him to Shelton. And they're threatening these young men. They're bullying them. They're intimidating them. In this day and age with the corona virus going on, while we're at home in our cold little outfit, these men are being tortured. They served their sentence. It was at Reynolds work release to be sent home, but by them being black, they got sent back to Shelton. Now, six innocent men were shipped to Shelton. They're only crying that they're black men. Now, I have to go through this again. 
you know, my son is in transit. He's not listed at no penitentiary, Shelton or Monroe. I can't put money on his book for him to reach out to his family on the media. Jay Spotter, whatever. When he was in Shelton, we got him what he needed. And he kept in contact with the family like that. But now, if he gets my letter, which he does in the last two weeks, he calls. He stays in contact. But, um, no. It's not fair. They serve their sentence. They were supposed to be coming home, but they get sent back. In my case, my son got sent back to prison without an infraction. Just that was audio from Mother Brown. We've been working on a little bit of tech difficulty, so I think we have her on the line. But in the meantime, let's bring up Nick Allen. All right, thanks. Uh... Davida. Um, well, Mother Brown, are you there? It's, um, it's good to see you. Hello, yes, I'm here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, a, it's really an honor to be able to sit down and talk with you. Um, those are really powerful words that we just heard from you, but also uh, really heavy, too. And I think that has been um, uh, from all of the speakers that, have, uh, that we've heard from tonight, really heavy stuff. Um, I know you've done a lot in the last few months to speak on behalf of not only your son, um, but advocate to advocate for people in prison and other DOC facilities. Just wanted to ask you some questions about that experience. How's that sound? Wonderful. Good. Thank you. So this segment is called Care Not Cages. Can you tell us what it means to you as it relates to your son's situation and other folks who've been locked up during the pandemic? They're not cages. Unfortunately, they're in cages. They're not getting care. It would be nice if they were getting care, the care that they need, especially during this time, being in the penitentiary and in the system is hard enough. But with the pandemic going on, their safety and their health is a big concern. Their living conditions is a mess. And the things we take for granted, like soap and water, is probably like gold. You know, they don't have the resources that they need just to be living healthy. So that's a big concern. Right, right. And uh, can you tell us some more about the situation that your, your son was in? You said he didn't have a lot of access to soap and water, no telephone calls. I think you had mentioned other, anything else? Can you give us an example of okay. the conditions? With, with my son, we stayed in contact while he was in doing his sentence. And then when he got the Reynolds work release, we stayed in contact. And then I lost contact with him. He was like two weeks from coming home and I lost contact with him. And I'm like, what's going on? I knew something was wrong. He wasn't answering my letters. He wasn't calling. So I reached out to the community. I called Reynolds for about two weeks and never got an answer. Finally, they finally asked him and said, oh, well, your son has been sent back to prison. I'm like, what? How could that possibly be? He was on his way home. He's five minutes away from home, and they sent him back to prison without an infraction because they was having a peaceful protest outside, which the inmates can't control what goes on outside. They're inside, so they shipped I use the word shit, but they sent six fellas back without no infraction. And while they was in transition, there was no contact on my end for two weeks, two to three weeks. I didn't know if this boy was alive or dead because he used to reach out on the media. 
but while he was lost in the system, he didn't have access to the media because he was not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, in the system. That's how they put it. Well, he's not, he's not in the system here. He's not in the system there, but he's located here. But he doesn't have no pencil or paper. He can't write. He can't. He's locked in his room 24 hours a day, you know, going stir crazy. Not 24 hours a day, I'm sorry. 23 hours, they're out an hour a day. So it's really, really hard on these men, especially with the pandemic going on. So he says, like, yeah, I'm writing this kid every day because I'm just, something's telling me he's not getting all your letters. Mm-hmm. So the few that he got, he said it just gave him peace of mind because it was his only communication. Right, right. And 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 what about you as a as a mother who was unsure of what had happened? Can you tell us what what you went through? Like, um, what were you afraid of? What I, hurt? I just went through a dark time in my life because um, I'm feeling his pain. You know, a mother knows when her son or her child they feel this. They know it's a sick sense when something is wrong. So I'm feeling this with him in my heart. And I'm at home in my cozy little house watching my TV with a mask locked down while these men are living shoulder to shoulder in unsafe conditions. And I'm just wondering, well, there's there's no safety there. No, there's no safety there. I'm just so scared any given moment. Well, of course, they're living in an infectious population. When he was at Reynolds, there were seven people. And now at Bishop Lewis this day, November 2020, there's 49 people infected with the coronavirus. That's half the population. And they're all living together. So it's very unsafe and very scary. And I can imagine how these grown men feel. And if they complain, they get threatened to be sent back to prison. And these men are sick. They have no voices. They get lost in the system. So let's be their voice. Let's do something and help these men have a safe passage home. Right. Thank you, Mother Brown. And and, and how, how... How were you able to find, you know, things like support, comfort, um, care, compassion during this during this trying time? Now, that is what is, and I use this word when I say amazing. I don't. I'm just saying the community. You know, I was so lost. If it wasn't for the community, I couldn't have gotten through this because they helped me locate him. They gave me resources. They've been a support factor in my life. And um, I've seen the, I've seen the community come together in all my 62 years as a uh, human beings during this pandemic. I've seen the people actually come together as one voice because it's about all the people. Now it's about all the people so other people can see how you get treated badly if you're different. It's not a crime to be black, it's a privilege and an honor. And, and Mother Brown, that's, um, you know, this, this event is focused on the, the concept of, of abolition. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. I wanted to see what your thoughts were on abolition and how it applies to the, to the situation faced by your son and the others that were, that were transferred back to prison uh, wrongly um, during the pandemic. What, what's been your thinking or takeaways about abolition uh, during this time?
Do we still have you, Mother Brown? Yeah, I'm still here. I would have to say it goes back to the to the community, the people fighting for what's right, trying to change the laws that are unjustified, and um, just bringing the people together as human beings. Justice for all. So the community played a big help, a big part in fighting for a change, changing the law of the land. As I said before, we won our freedom in the Civil War, but we lost it back to man's law. So it's time for a change at last. Got to change the way of the system. It's failed us and it was built to fail. So now we need to rebuild it to win. That's right. Well, Mother Brown, thank you for your, your time and your insightful words and all the support and work that you've been doing during this time um, to raise awareness and uh, support your son and the others that were put in this situation. I wanted to um, go back to something you had mentioned earlier about a number of people testing positive at, at Bishop Lewis work release. Uh, what happened back in May was an outbreak at Reynolds work release. And due to uh, the Department of Corrections mishandling of the outbreak, a number of people fell ill with COVID. And as Mother Brown said, uh, there were demonstrations to call DOC out about that, which ended up in a number of people being retaliated against and sent back to the Department of Corrections for doing nothing wrong. The same thing is now happening at Bishop Lewis work release. As Mother Brown said, over uh, 35 people have tested positive there. And we're seeing the same pattern take place where individuals that have uh, spoken up, that have challenged the mismanagement of the COVID virus in the work release facility have been sent back to prison and placed in isolation there. Uh, some folks with COVID and now are being told that they may have to serve the rest of their time in prison. These are folks that are a few weeks away, a few months away from release back into their communities. And I wanted to raise that because a lot of the folks that Mother Brown is referencing have been uh, organizing again around um, uh, these um, uh, 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 troubling circumstances uh, in DOC facilities. And I believe in the chat, there's a letter that's been put together um, to request that um, legislators, uh, the governor, uh, hold DOC accountable and take steps to make sure that these actions don't occur again in the future. It's interesting that the uh, uh, Reynolds 6 situation was a, a, a great uh, experience for community, for legislators, uh, for legal advocates, people in the institutions to come together um, to really make a difference, to call DOC out. Um, but we have to remember that uh, it's not limited to this one circumstance. We still have a lot of work to do. And this is still going on to this day, uh, as Mother Brown mentioned. So I'd like to thank um, Mother Brown for her time, uh, for her insight, and also direct you all to the chat uh, if you're interested in following up on the Bishop Lewis um, outbreak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. I just want to take a moment to celebrate uh, Nick and celebrate Mother Brown Mother Brown um, has been incredibly courageous and um, caring for and collaborating with other families and teaching us all how we can be fighters for our loved ones inside. And before passing it off to Dakota, I just want to remind us of the things that we, that we heard about tonight. We heard about healing and repair, eyes on Native and Black mass incarceration experiences, free them all, and uh, an incredible art hit with Sa'ari and Historias de Resistencia, Family Stories of Detention and Care Not Cages, a mother on the front lines of COVID outbreaks. And for us to hold those stories 
and then even more be moved to action. So please don't miss the chat uh, where there is the letter that you can sign and share and also the things that Madhu pointed us to earlier in the evening of how we can be tweeting at, emailing, calling the mayor, elected officials in Tacoma and um, supporting La Resistencia in their work. And Dakota, on to you to close us out for the evening. Um, well, thank, thank you again. I, I'm actually here to make an announcement to you all. Um, this that you see right here is the, uh, the promo for Legendary Children, which is an annual library event. Uh, happens every five years. This is the fifth year anniversary. It's digital this year. It's an event that celebrates and honors the house and ballroom scene as it is uh, practiced here in the Pacific Northwest. We have a really fly lineup for you, um, which includes the marvelous Monet's, the Royal House of Princeton, the Royal House of Noir, uh, the illustrious House of Essence, the House of Boba, and the Celestial House of Arcadia. You have to make sure you get those names right. Um, but it also has some of the most fly queer and trans artists here in the Pacific Northwest, including Stormy Weber, Gumat Gelat, um, uh, Cy Wonderland, who is from Tacoma. Um, we're going to be featuring a video of Christopher Paul Jordan's uh, I'm and I'm going to miss everybody's new uh, AIDS memorial sculpture that is going up. Uh, and it's there's just so much. There's just so much. And you don't want to miss it. Um, you see all this fun that people are having in this video? This could be you Saturday at 8 p.m. It's free, it's streaming, it's Seattle Public Library's brilliance in collaboration with the Seattle Art Museum. Thank you to Davida Ingram and to David Rue. Um, I am one of your community co-curators, and so if you had any amount of fun with me today, you just know what we're gonna do on Saturday. And that, folks, we are at the end of our program. Can we give it up for all of our speakers, for our incredible MC, Nikita Oliver? Um, there is an event survey and the RSVP link for Legendary Children. We do have uh, one other program that we haven't posted, which is December 11th, the Black Trans Prayer Book with Jay Mace III. We could not have done this event without you. We also want you to know once it's uploaded and captioned, we will put this on YouTube and you can help us spread the word. Thank you for coming to love in the time of COVID. We love you and we appreciate you and good night.